This video extends the discussion of controllability to discrete systems. So the last two videos have looked at controllability for continuous time state space models of this form, x dot equals ax plus bu and y equals cx plus du. This video considers to what extent the same concepts and tests for controllability can be used for discrete state space models. And there's an example of a discrete state space model. So we've got the sample, the state at sample k plus 1 equals a times the state at sample k plus b times the input at sample k. A reminder then of what controllability means. It means for an arbitrary initial condition and an arbitrary end point, so x0 the initial condition, xn the state n samples ahead, then you can think of a sequence of input changes u of k which take you from x of 0 to x of n. And the key point is that there must always exist a u of k no matter what x of 0 and x of n are chosen to be. A key point is that we need to use at least n samples in discrete time to make sure that we've got sufficient degrees of freedom in the input sequence u. Now, in continuous time, the end time at which the desired state was to be achieved did not need to be defined or constrained in any way because u of t can be changed continuously. In discrete time, your degrees of freedom are just the inputs at the specific sample, so they're much more constrained. So the input can only be changed at each sampling instant, and therefore, to meet the end constraints associated to uh, the state being at the specified point and there being n states, you need at least an n-dimensional number of degrees of freedom. So in general, you need at least n inputs. Let's look at how you predict with discrete models. What we can do is we can say here's the model at sample k which you use to get the predicted state on sample head xk plus 1. I can use the same model at any sample I like so xk plus 2 equals axk plus 1 plus buk plus 1 and xk plus 3 equals axk plus 2 plus buk plus 2 and so on and this is how I can eventually predict n steps ahead. Now what I'm going to do next is use these to find a different form of prediction. So for what I'm going to do is take the prediction for xk plus 1 and put it into this expression here and if I do that I find that the two step ahead prediction is given as a squared xk plus buk plus 1 plus a b u k. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this prediction for xk plus 2 and put it in here. And when I do that you find I get xk plus 3 equals a cubed xk plus b uk plus 2 plus a b uk plus 1 plus a squared b uk and so on. Now if I keep doing the same pattern then you'll end up eventually with the n step ahead prediction takes this form here. xk plus n is a to the n xk plus n minus 1 and then you see we've got this sum from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of a to the i b uk plus n minus i minus 1. Now what I'm going to do next is express this in matrix form so I don't like these summations because they're messy so I'm going to use a matrix instead. So you'll see what we've done is we've taken this summation and instead we've rewritten it using matrices. So that's what we've done here. We've said an equivalent expression is the matrix B, A, B, all the way to A, N minus 1, B times the vector U, K plus N minus 1, U, K plus N minus 2, and so on, down to U, K. Now, what's interesting about this expression for the N step ahead prediction? If you look at that matrix, you will see this is precisely the controllability matrix which was defined in the previous video. And what we said in the previous video was that if MC is full rank, then we're controllable. And here you'll see you're going to get exactly the same inside. If this matrix is full rank, then there's enough degrees of freedom in your choices of input, U here, so that you can place XK plus N wherever you like. So you find the same controllability test you used for continuous time works for discrete time, even though the derivation is somewhat different. 
So in summary, the same controllability matrix as defined for continuous time also works for discrete time. And a system is fully controllable if the controllability matrix is full rank. So for a system like this, the controllability matrix is B, A, B, A squared, B, all the way up to A to the N minus 1B. And we just need to test the rank of this matrix. You'll also remember with continuous time, we looked at controllability using eigenvalue eigenvector decompositions. So we might be interested in, are there any analogies between the continuous time and the discrete case using the same issues? So in the continuous time, we found that the system was fully controllable if and only if the matrix VB had no zero rows, where V was the matrix of left eigenvectors. Let's see what we can do here then. Again, what I'm going to do is start by writing the prediction for the state n samples ahead. So that's the same expression we had just a few slides ago. But now I'm going to do something different. I'm going to recognize that a to the power i can be written as the eigenvector matrix w times lambda to the i, where lambda is the diagonal matrix of eigenvalues, times v. And then I'm going to substitute that expression back into this summation. I'm also going to recognize that W is given by the eigenvector. So the matrix W is given by the eigenvectors W1 to Wn. And if we assume you have distinct eigenvalues, then this matrix is known to be full rank. So We've got the same expression we had on the previous slide, and all I've done first is exactly what I've said. I've replaced all the a to the i's by w lambda to the i v. So that's exactly the same step as on the previous slide. And now what I'm going to do is say, just a minute, I can actually unpack this expression, w lambda to the i v, and I've done it here in this inner brackets. I can write it as the sum over j of wj lambda j to the power i vj transpose. So that's making use of this eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition and making use of the fact that the eigenvectors and left eigenvectors um, basically are orthogonal. So having done that, next what I want to do is separate each of these modes for convenience. So I'm going to take this mode here where I've got the j's and I'm going to separate them out. So if I do that, you find you end up with his mode 1. I've got a sum from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of the mode 1 behavior. And then a sum from i equals 0 to n minus 1 of the mode 2 behavior, and so on. Now, why is that interesting? Because clearly, I can now rewrite what I've got as xn is the sum over j of omega j alpha j where the alpha j's take this form here. They're the bits I separated out above. So it's clear that if we want to choose x of n arbitrarily, we need two conditions. And I'm basically pulling on uh, video two from this series, um, so not repeating that. So you can go back there if you want to look at issues of rank. And what we've said is x of n can be chosen arbitrarily as long as these wi's span the space, or wj's, which means that the matrix w has to be full rank, which we know already. And also, what we need is that these alphas are not zero and can be specified as required. Well, the alphas are given here. And clearly, I can specify these by choosing the u's as I want. But there is a caveat, the same caveat as we saw in video 2. So here's the definition of the alphas, and we require that we can choose these however we please. But within this expression, there's this beta term. Beta j transposed equals vj transposed b. You'll see there it is. So we can assume that the input u is a free variable, the input we can choose. So alpha j can be chosen freely if and only if this beta j is not zero. If beta j is zero, then clearly alpha j is zero. And therefore, a final state with a component in the corresponding eigenvector direction cannot be reached. And you will notice this is the same insight and conclusion that we got for continuous time systems in video two.
So in both the continuous time case and the discrete time case, we can test the controllability using an eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition. So you'll notice we've got continuous time here with the matrix A and B, or discrete time here with the matrix A and B. We do an eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition of the matrix A, and in both cases, we're fully controllable if and only if VB has no zero rows. So a summary, the tests for controllability are the same for both continuous and discrete cases, and that's great because we get two for the price of one. So we either form the controllability matrix and assure its full rank, and you'll see it's the same controllability matrix in both cases, or we do an eigenvalue eigenvector decomposition and we check that the matrix VB has no zero rows. And what we've said earlier is the former of these, that is this controllability matrix, is often the easiest to test to use.